thank you, God. Oh, thank you, God. Oh, thank you, God. I see the light. Whoa. Whoa. Come on, give him a shout of praise today. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad you see the light? What a wonderful blessing to see clearly what God has done for us in this world. Glad you're here today. Let's ask God to speak to our hearts through his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word that it's living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Just pray that you would speak to our hearts through your living word today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, Pastor Mac mentioned we're going to be doing a series on marriage. Then That's starting in February. And I don't uh, know how long you've been married. Uh, how many of you have been married less than five years? Less than five years. Less than 10 years. Okay. Uh, less than 20 years. Okay. You can still learn. How about less than 40 years? All right, there we go. How many have been married over 50? Okay, hi, Dale. <laughs> All right, well, marriage is a wonderful thing. Uh, we're going on 39 years. It's exciting. Uh, my wife has uh, really helped me to become more of what God wants me to be, and marriage is a wonderful thing. Uh, so marriage, will be starting that in February. Uh, we'll be having a special speaker on the 8th, uh, Many of you uh, probably uh, know that I uh, worked at Glad Tidings for many years uh, with the Dean family. Uh, Jonas Dean and his wife will be sharing on marriage and what they've gone through and some of the conflict and how God has done a miracle for them. Uh, and I really like the idea of passing out a card, inviting somebody to come uh, to, that, to that marriage class. It's like a class. We're going to be talking about marriage but it's from God's word, and so invite people to come to that. Uh, we're doing a series on Jesus in the 21st century, and so <clears throat> as we uh, get back into the scripture, uh, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going back to the Beatitudes. We have one that we did not cover, and I'll be going back to the Beatitudes today. Uh, but the last few weeks, if you've missed, we've been talking about our vision uh, for 2015 and how God... Uh, cares so much for the lost and he told his disciples Jesus said go out into the highways and the byways and compel people to come so my house might be full that's God's heart's desire and he uses us as Christians to invite others to come and hear about him and so I want to encourage you whether you're in high school and in, in grade school and junior high college if you're uh, in the working uh, world, invite people to come to church. God wants you to do that. Invite others to come to church. Keep that in your heart. Uh, we talked about uh, creative ways and, and, and the urgency to do that last week. And we talked about the four men who took their paralyzed friend. And they brought their paralyzed friend to Jesus because Jesus had the answer for their paralyzed friend. They knew that if there was any hope for their friend, they needed to get their friend to Jesus. And when they got their friend to the house, it was packed in Caper Capernaum there. Everyone was around the house. There was no room uh, to even get close. And so they worked their way. They got a ladder. And in Israel, they have flat roofs. And so they climbed up on the roof, they got some ropes, they lifted their paralyzed friend up on a mat, uh, and they lifted their friend up on the roof, they took some of the roofing apart, and they lowered their friend down right in front of Jesus. Can you imagine? Now that's really going the extra mile to get your friend to church, isn't it? And so that's what they did to get their friend to hear about Jesus. What are you going to do to get your friends to hear about Jesus? And the amazing thing that took place there was when Jesus saw them and he saw their faith, he said to the man, 
Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Now, I want you to consider that for a moment. <clears throat> Here their friends are certainly expecting a miracle, but they weren't expecting that. Now, I want to ask you the question, what's more important, being healed from a cancer or, or paralysis or having your sins forgiven? Well, that's the greatest miracle of all, isn't it? And so Jesus, seeing their faith, began with the greatest miracle of all. He said, your sins are forgiven. And there are people in that room that were so upset, the religious people, the Pharisees, saying, who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, you're right. And he asked them a question. What's easier to do? Say, get up and walk? Or to say your sins are forgiven. He said to show you that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins on earth. I'm going to tell you. Now get up and walk. And he healed the man. And the man jumped up joyfully and was healed. But the greatest miracle started first. Your sins are forgiven. If we would keep that in mind... There wouldn't be a week that would go by that we would not consider having somebody in church with us to have the greatest miracle of all take place, to have their sins forgiven through Jesus Christ, and to have a brand new life begin <clears throat> with hope. And so that's our vision for 2015. Jesus said, go out and tell them to come so my house will be full. We want heaven to be full. So let's start filling up God's church with new people to come to know Christ. Very important. <clears throat> Today we'll go back, <clears throat> excuse me, to Matthew 5, and it's the Sermon on the Mount. It was the Beatitudes. We'll just catch you up on that quickly, and we've got a lot to cover. This is Jesus preaching. One day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, <clears throat> and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and justice, for they shall be satisfied. <clears throat> God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted <clears throat> for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it, <clears throat> be very glad, for a great re reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Interesting, as we look at those scriptures, and we have talked about the majority of them, except being persecuted for Christ's sake. Have you been persecuted <clears throat> for being a Christian? certainly see in the world around us uh, that there is a spiritual battle. We need to pray for the people of Paris uh, as they've experienced what we experienced like a 9-11 to them uh, with this tragedy. It was a terrible tragedy. We need to pray and we need to pray for peace. In the end times, Jesus tells us, and the church has been persecuted for many, many years, we're going to be persecuted. <clears throat> There's a spiritual war going on, and certainly uh, Christians are looked at as infidels. Uh, we, we are in a spiritual battle, a spiritual battle. Uh, not just Christians, Jews as well. And so uh, we're going to be persecuted for our faith. What would you do if you <clears throat> were facing death unless you denied Christ? What would you do? This is serious stuff when we look at our life. What would we do? <clears throat> and so 
Today we see that it says, blessed are those who are persecuted <clears throat> for righteousness' sake. Uh, it, theirs is the kingdom of God. Theirs is the kingdom of God. As we go on here, we see that Jesus, after he talks about the Beatitudes first, then he says, and we've already talked about this, <clears throat> he says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So your, see the Beatitudes were preached before the salt and the light. Because it's one thing to tell others about Jesus. It's another thing for them to see Jesus at work in you. To see your love and hunger for righteousness and for God. To see your humility and your meekness. To see your attitude towards others. To see how you treat your spouse. To see how you treat your children. This is what the world is looking at. To see, is, are you really the real deal? <clears throat> is there anything credible, credible about your Christianity? What has it done for you? How has it changed your life? And the way you live. Why are you better off than me? And so true Christianity... Certainly, to be credible, needs fruit to back it up. And that's why Jesus talks about the Beatitudes. <clears throat> he wants us to be fruit. And so God <clears throat> wants you, by your wonderful good works, by your love for him, by your, by your walk in purity and humility and meekness, he wants that to cause thirst. You're the salt. Salt creates what? So he wants your life to create thirst in the people you work with. How does that woman have so much patience when that patient was such a jerk just now? And, and how, do, how do you do that? How do you keep being kind? And how do you do And it creates thirst in that person. What makes you so happy? Right? And so often we as Christians, oh, nah, I don't know. What should we be saying? Hello? Let me tell you what makes me happy, all right? I'm not always happy, but I, I go through problems. But Jesus Christ has changed my life. That's what makes the difference. What an opportunity. Let me tell you about it. Come to my church and visit with me sometime. I'll show you what makes me happy. God has changed my life. Now, the world is looking for people that have sincere and real, authentic Christianity. It doesn't mean we have to be perfect, uh, but they will see the virtues that Jesus just talked about. And so this last beatitude, blessed are those who are persecuted, <clears throat> right? They're persecuted for uh, righteousness sake. It says uh, when they lie about you, say all sorts of evil things about you when you become my followers. <clears throat> Think about it. When you became a Christian, how many of you lost some of your old friends? Just slip your hands up. Okay, some of you lost your old friends. It happens when you become a Christian. Um, when you become a Christian, uh, how many of you have had problems with your family relations because you became a Christian? Just slip your hand up. Many of you had problems with family relations. And so what did we do about that? <clears throat> um, I remember when I was dating Karen, and her mother said, um, you got to be careful. She said, my friend told me when she dropped Thor off, I was dating Karen, she dropped me off at home one night in high school, and I told her about Jesus on the way down the road, and uh, I lived down in the hillside, and Karen lived in Duluth Heights, and, <clears throat> and I was talking to her about Jesus, and anyway, she told Mary Ann, you got to tell Karen to be careful, for there's overly religious ones. Isn't that interesting? Watch out for that guy, you know. Um, <clears throat> the world doesn't have a clue sometimes about true Christianity. And so God wants us to show them that it's real. 
Uh, to be a disciple, Jesus tells us in Matthew 16, he goes on to tell us more about this persecution and, and what it means to be a true follower of Jesus. Matthew 16, if you turn to that with me. And remember, these are the words of Christ. It's, it's uh, prerequisites to being a Christian. This is what comes first before a person can be a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Matthew 16, <clears throat> and we'll start with verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, <clears throat> If any of you want to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, some standing here will, will, right now will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, so, people wonder, well, what does that mean? Did some of those people never die or what happened? Well, soon after Jesus said that, he went to the Mount of Transfiguration and there he was uh, transfigured before his disciples, before uh, James and John and uh, Peter. And, and he, was, he was, Moses came there and I believe Elijah, they had uh, just a reunion from people that had been around hundreds of years before. And Jesus was transfigured. Someday we will see Jesus in his glory. We'll see Moses. That's kind of cool, right? Uh, we'll see Daniel. <clears throat> You'll be able to talk to him about what he felt like when he went to the lion's den. We'll be able to talk to these heroes. We'll see Rahab, a harlot in heaven, who was in the direct line of Jesus coming, right? We'll see all of the, We'll be able to talk with them. <clears throat> and isn't it cool that maybe we'll sit down and talk for a year Maybe a couple years. Just think, never will our life end. We will be alive forever and ever and ever. And that's what Jesus said. Keep your eyes on me. This is just a small, just a, a dash in eternity. We're just here for a short time. That's why living our life for Christ is so important. Jesus said, if you want to be my follower, you're going to have to deny yourself Take up your cross and follow me. The cross is a sign of suffering. Are you willing to take up your cross and follow Christ? What if he were to come to you face to face and tell you, I want you to quit your job and I want you to go to the mission field? What would you say? What would you say? Is it possible Jesus would say that? Absolutely. Look at how many missionaries we have uh, around the world supporting uh, Jesus and his teachings. <clears throat> so what does it cost to follow Jesus? Everything. That's all. Everything. Your life. Your life. You might say, well, what does it mean to really deny him? <clears throat> Think about it. We have so many people that help in our church. It's so wonderful to see. They come on Sundays. They greet people. They're ushers. Uh, they help with our children's ministry. They help with uh, youth ministry. They're giving. So they're denying what? Their time. Okay, so what does it mean to take up your cross, deny yourself? You deny your time. Do you deny yourself that evening at home of just lounging, and you come and help on Wednesday nights. You deny yourself maybe an extra couple hours Sunday morning. Maybe you, you serve in the nursery for the first service and you come to church the second service. It's called deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. What are you doing for Jesus? What are you doing for Jesus and his church and his kingdom? What are you doing? I think it's an important question, right? Anyone think it's important? I see a few people yawning. Some, someday we're going to stand before Jesus Christ and we're going to have to give an account of what we have done with what he's given us. What are you doing for him? 
What are you doing? What have you denied yourself? What have you denied yourself? So we deny our time. We deny our time. We deny our dreams. Well, does that mean that God won't let me fulfill my dreams if I become a Christian? It means you have to lay them at the cross. Maybe you say, well, I don't want to really be a pastor or an evangelist or any of that. Well, Jesus didn't say you had to, but he said all of us are to evangelize and be his witnesses. So no matter what it is. But what if that's all you wanted to do from the time you were a kid is be a doctor? And, and you get serious about Jesus when you're a teenager. Maybe you're challenged to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Christ. And so you spend some time on your knees and you say, Lord, what does it mean? And maybe God says, lay that dream down on the altar and give me your life. Give me your life. I want you to follow me. And so you humbly lay that dream down and, and then God, maybe he gives it back to you. But he wants you to be willing to lay it down. He gave it to Luke, right? Luke was a physician. We, all, we have different things that God allows us to do to minister to people. But he wants our heart. And he wants us to lay our dreams down at the cross and say, I am yours. I'm not myself. I've been bought with a price, and therefore I should glorify you with my life, period. So it's what you want from me, God. I'll follow you wherever you want me to go. So that's what Jesus said about being a true disciple. We deny our time. We deny our dreams. We deny our comfort. Doesn't mean we all go sell our homes unless God tells us to sell our homes, right? Are you willing to sell your home and go to the mission field if God calls you? We have a family in our church. They'll be selling their home in a couple of years and they're going to go work on mercy ships. Pretty interesting. Why? Because they're willing to say, yes, Lord, I'll follow. I'll follow. You see, Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. I was uh, sent a devotional book <clears throat> from the Assemblies of God, and it had, uh, it was a beautiful book, uh, 30, 365 devotionals, and, and Karen was reading it one day, and she said, I was thinking, you know, sometimes you read these things, you don't even know these people, it'd be nice if you knew who they were that were even in the book. And then I read some of the acknowledgments, and one was, Jeremy Owens. And it has you pray for different missionaries throughout the world. Jeremy Owens grew up in our youth group in the little white church and came over here and we support him as a missionary. He gave up comfort. He gave up dreams of being rich and affluent. He gave up everything because of his love for Jesus. And when that young man read the words, Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. It meant something to him. It wasn't just reading words. So often when you read the Bible, you're just reading words. I want you to realize it's the living word of God. These words are for us today. The same requirements of being a disciple of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago are relevant today. He says, deny yourself. What are you doing for Jesus? What are you denying for him? What are you denying for him? In America, we have it very good. Yes, there are hurting and poor people that we have to pray for and help. But in America, we've been blessed. But the commands are there. Deny yourself. I see people serving in our nursery, serving all over the church. Deny yourself. Your comfort. <clears throat> Deny your money. 
Oh, now you're getting personal, Pastor. Would Jesus tell you to deny your money? Some of you are stingy people. Have you ever been accused of that? Is Leo here? We call him Scrooge. And, and so some of, some of us, uh, some of us, uh, as we... See, God will lay it right on the line. He wants our heart. That's what he wants. He doesn't want just part of it. He wants all of it. He wants our heart. True discipleship. And then we, we look at that, and <clears throat> I, I look at the faithful people in our church. The majority of you, I don't have to even talk to you about this because you're faithful and you love the Lord. You see, tithing is just where beginners get in. That's what we're told to do, to be faithful. Faithful with 10% of what the Lord gives us, to give to his church so the church can operate to touch lives. Faithfulness. Tithing. Are you faithful? We have people, they go on vacation, they mail their tithe here when they're gone. That's faithful. Faithful. People who are watching online, they tithe to the church. They're faithful. You are faithful. But see, are we all faithful? What if Jesus said, hey, the 10% is fine, but I want it all. I want it all. For some of you, he would say, well, here's a quarter. That's all I got, right? But what if you really had a lot of money? How many remember the story of the rich young ruler? The rich young ruler, Jesus challenged him. He asked, what should I do to have eternal life? Jesus said, you know, obey the commandments. He said, I, which ones? Honor your father and mother. And all of these wonderful things. Don't commit adultery. Uh, don't steal. Don't lie. And the young man was so excited. He said, I want to be your follower. He said, Jesus said, do these things. First of all, though, sell everything you have. Give your money to the poor and follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. Sell everything you have. This man... <clears throat> had a lot of money so when Jesus told him sell everything you had he was challenged and he turned away and he did not follow Jesus what a sad day and it says Jesus loved him but he did not change the requirement he didn't say oh just give half of it keep half of it for your he, he didn't change the requirement because there was something in that heart of that young man that was more important to him than God, more than important to him than following Christ, and it was his money. Pretty interesting. What would Jesus tell you today? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. <clears throat> All of these things are so very important. Matthew 23, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 23. Matthew 23, and we'll start with verse 23. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites? For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the most important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Blind guides, you strain your water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Very interesting here is Jesus was talking to religious people that did not have relationship. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can be religious and go to church and tithe and not know Christ. Jesus tells us that. It doesn't, it doesn't give you an assurance of going to heaven by giving your money to God. He wants a relationship. He said, yes, you should have tithed. That's right. But you forgot the most important things. Love, mercy, caring for others, going out, touching other lives. You forgot the most important thing. You're just into religion. You hypocrites. Can you imagine how those Pharisees felt? 
right? Can you imagine just how angry? They, well, we know how angry they were. They crucified him, didn't they? They found something they could do to crucify this wonderful man. So here we see <clears throat> we need to surrender. It's total surrender. It's not partial surrender. It's total surrender. Total surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Follow me. And that's what the rich young ruler had a hard time doing. Total <clears throat> surrender. Luke chapter 14. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Luke 14. And we'll start with verse 25. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father, your mother, your wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. Okay, this is about telling others about following Jesus. What's it going to cost? You remember? Everything. That's all. Everything. It's going to cost your dreams, your time, everything. So Jesus tells us if we don't take up our cross and follow him, we can't be his disciple. Don't begin until you count the cost, Jesus says. And he tells him, count the cost. Understand what it really means to be a Christian. Understand what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Understand what it means. Like we were talking about denying your time at home and helping at church. Denying your money and helping the poor. Denying yourselves this and helping others. Understand what it means. He said, don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? How many remember the house on Masaba Avenue who had... Uh, for probably decades, uh, scaffolding in front of the house. Anyone remember that house? They didn't calculate the cost, apparently, to finish the siding or whatever they were doing to finish the house. And so here he says, you gotta, you got you to gotta count the cost. Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And that everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started the building on Masaba and couldn't afford to finish it. I hope you're not here today. <laughs> then Jesus says, Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send out a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Boy, those are challenging words, isn't it? Everything you own. That means my house isn't mine. It's God's. And if he tells me to sell it and go to the mission field, I better follow. Right? Uh, all of these things. Salt is good for seasoning. But if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile that is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. And so here we hear teachings of Jesus. Are they relevant in the 21st century? Absolutely they're relevant. Because Jesus would say the same thing to you today if you're going to be his follower. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. And follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross, 
and follow me. Henry, how long were you in, on the mission field? Nine years? My brother Henry gave up nine years of, of his life. He lived on nothing but poverty. He was in poverty trying to help street kids in Brazil. Poverty. God said, Henry, deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. And he did it. But you know what? He's still saying that today to every one of us. So do you want to hear from God or are you afraid to hear what he's going to say? What is he going to say? Yes, I want you to get involved. Get off your easy chairs. Your comfort. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. What are you doing for God's kingdom? What are you doing? Just taking up space? What are you doing for God's kingdom? God wants you involved in his kingdom. Adam, does your wife need any more workers in the nursery? Absolutely. Absolutely. We need help in the nursery. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. So you should be, we should have a line up there. Yeah, I'd like, can I get a chance? What happened to service and sacrifice? What happened to what Jesus said about denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following him? What happened? And so here we see there's something that God wants us to do. He wants us to count the cost. Count the cost. God wants us to bring others to him. But he wants us to be honest with them that being a Christian is all about sacrifice, just like Jesus sacrificed for us. If you're going to be a Christian, you need to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. Follow him. Then Jesus says, anyone who has ears to hear, let him hear. In a moment, I'm going to have the worship team come back. And I'd like you to consider what you need to deny and what you need to do differently. And maybe there's people here that have never even truly made that commitment to deny their self and to follow Christ no matter what. Here I am. I don't care how old you are. Here I am. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old. doesn't matter. Here I am. I'm yours. I'm going to follow you. Matthew 7, <clears throat> the last part of Christ's Sermon on the Mount, it's very challenging. <clears throat> very challenging. Matthew 7, the last part of the chapter. <clears throat> and sometimes you read the Bible and it seems like, what, what did, what did, like I said, what did I read? What did I read? Thor, what do you call that one verse that your phone has that pops up? What do you call it? The unapplicable verse of the day. Um, what did it say today? Something about, and John wrote his letter to Gaius. And that's all it said. And I thought, who, who invented that program? <laughs> you know, boy, that's a good one. I'm going to go all day on that. Right? And, and so, so having verses, Scripture, God wants us to realize this Scripture can apply to our everyday life. Everyday life. Yes, there are some things that are just history. We read about. But God wants you to apply this. And here in Matthew 7, Jesus tells us something very important. In verse 21... Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name 
and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Anyone who listens to my teachings and follows them is like a wise man, a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters <clears throat> rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and ignores it, it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. And so today, build your house on the rock. Follow Jesus with your whole heart. Not half-heartedly, with your whole heart. A coach, if he's going to have a good team, he can't have guys that show up for practice once in a while. Yeah, I'll get there when I can make it, coach. Get there when I can make it. Would that work in Esco? Wouldn't work in Esco, would it? And Jesus said the same thing. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. I'd like you to bow your heads in prayer. And just consider today what areas in my life do I need to deny that I haven't? What things should I be doing for God's kingdom that I haven't been doing? Am I truly a Christian? Have I really counted the cost? Have I counted the cost? Well, maybe today you'd say, Pastor, I understand that a little clearer today. And I want to count the cost. I want to say no matter what, I'm going to follow Jesus to the very end. I want to serve him. I want to give him my life, my all. Friend, if you haven't done that or if you have to reconsider that today you can pray and make an altar right where you're at but the altars will be open we'll sing one closing song if you want to pray up front maybe solidify some things with